Since we're in a Philly motif, I'm going to also read a poem that's, that's um, I'll, start with a, I'll start with a poem that's also set in Philadelphia. It's called, it's called Terry Moore, who was a good, who is still a good friend of mine, but uh, we met at, uh, in seventh grade long, long ago. Um, there's only one thing that I think probably needs to be explained. I think the poem will tell you everything else, but uh, when we were in, when we were in uh, school, uh, there was a slang, um, mini skirts were relatively new. It was a new idea when we were uh, in what we called junior high school, which you guys would have called middle school. And, uh, Sam, I'm just gonna interrupt just a little Okay, bit yeah, that's fine. Or maybe I could just speak yeah. more directly into it. That's great. I think Matt subverted the mic for a second, but I twisted it away. Okay, is that better? Is it better? You can still turn it off if you like. But anyway, so anyway, if a girl had um, really nice legs um, and she was wearing a miniskirt, you might, for example, say to your boy, say, man, check out that cheese over there. <laughs> that was a slang. I don't think anybody uses it anymore, but that was it. Okay. That's, I think everything else would be pretty clear. It's a poem of memory, as I said. Uh, <laughs> Terry Moore. Our moms got us together at Woolworths. Remember? Cheeseburgers, summertime, 1967. Twelve years in the world, mostly, we burned for football, to get it and move, to shake anybody that wanted to bring us down. Six points was all we needed and time to find the future where we'd be badass superstars. We thought it was hard being young with adults running things and it got harder not to think about girls and which words would bring them close to our hands? Mini skirts. Remember checking the cheese in study hall? <laughs> Marna Evans. We had no idea where those legs could lead. If it weren't for movies and the legends of our big brothers, we might never have believed in smooth whispers, long kisses, and maybe even now, we'd be dreaming only football. The rough touch of leather, tightly laced, grabbed and carried to a place where men dance with nothing to explain. The end zone, the promised land. And who could blame us for craving such a simple destination? Then came Joni, and for me, it was Jane. Short hugs, slow songs, their mouths swimming into our mouths. Among the Philly brothers, the word was swag. Did you swag on her? We'd ask, supposing the wet dream of lips. How many times did y'all swag? So new, the French kiss, the perfect neighborhood for anyone as crazy and blue balled as boys blazing on the verge of the verge of their lives. Man, we spent years on the phone daring each other not to be young, not to be afraid of whatever sex might mean. That paperback you found, Nurse Nadine, the way she treated her patients what exactly was a blowjob? And how long would it be till we knew? Our fathers were scary men, younger than we are now, and ready to make themselves clear without saying anything, especially when we got too cool to listen, too big to hear. Did they believe in sex? the way we were starting to? Was there some secret living softly inside their fists? My father loved my mother. 
It looks so simple. Year after year, the kiss, goodbye after breakfast, the kiss hello about five, conversation at dinner, TV until time for bed. It's pretty clear I didn't know much about my parents, just that they were usually nice people and mostly on my side. And this makes me wonder just how blind I'm going to be, because these days I hardly see anything the way I saw things back then. And brah, my eyes are wide open. The NFL will never see us. I can't do half the moves we used to do. Loose leg lean, that cut back stutter, short grass lit beneath our simmering feet. But I'm glad these 40 years have found us still friends, that we played some football and watched each other break slowly into men which is what we are by now, which was always what we thought we really wanted. Thank you. This is a Villanelle. Uh, I call it the zombie blues Villanelle. I mean, you probably have all noticed how many zombie-related movies and TV shows there are. And I can't help but think that they're, that they're making a comment on us as much as they are on any, any fantasy. What does it mean to be a zombie, huh? Zombie blues Villanelle. <laughs> There are days I believe there is nothing to fear. I rev up for green lights, my engine on call. But it could be the zombies are already near. That sleep that we feed every day of the year. What's up with your friends when they circle the mall? There are nights when I think I have no one to fear. My mom watches Oprah to sweeten the year. You can keep your eyes open, see nothing at all. But it might be the zombies are already near. You think life is supposed to be lived in this gear? Been asking that question till my brain has gone raw. Certain days I believed I had nothing to fear. I have dreams where I'm driving with no way to steer. You can growl like a cello. You can chat like a doll. At the games, ain't it always the zombies who cheer? I think fear itself is a whole lot to fear. I have watched CNN till it made my skin crawl. I might be a zombie that's already here. I've been pounding this door, but don't nobody hear. You can drink till you think that you're seven feet tall. Fast dances, good chances, and nothing to fear. You can fly through your days until time is a smear. Maybe blaze up the bong or blog out a blog. There'll be days when you know you've got nothing to fear. But you could be a zombie that's already here.
There's a poem. This is the, there are a series of poems in the voice of Blade, the daywalker. Most of you know who Blade is. I won't explain it. I'll read the epigraph for the few of you who may not know who Blade or what Blade was. Um, but this is the first one. So the epigraph will lead right to the title and then the poem will be in, in Blade's voice. <coughs> Years ago, a pregnant woman was bitten by a vampire and turned. Her son was born with a thirst, but being half human, he could walk in sunlight unharmed. Though vampires quietly dominate the world, he fights them, in part to prove his allegiance to humanity, in part to avenge his long isolation, being neither human nor vampire. Because of his deadly expertise and weapon of choice, they call him Blade, the Daywalker. Like a stake in my heart, this life. The seen, the unseen, the ones who look in the mirror and find nothing but innocence, though they stand in blood up to their knees. You see them, shadows, not shadows, people who seem to be people. You don't believe me? I watch their news, drink coffee in their chains. There's no place they haven't touched. It's almost like I can't wake up, like I'm living in a movie, a kind of dream, action-packed thriller. I never dreamed this hunger in my veins, this mind that cannot sleep. Why? Do I wet this blade when they will not die? Thank you very much. I have to recognize Michael Waters in the audience. Um, early on, um, when I was just beginning to study poetry, um, there's a literary festival at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And Michael Waters came to read. Now, I'd been, we'd been reading his poems um, before the festival, but then he came to the festival, and it was a really beautiful reading. And, it's, and I say this only because it was, in large part, because of such readings that I really wanted to become a poet. I mean, I love the language on the page, but I also thought there was something really powerful and, and concert-like at a good reading. So, Michael Waters, I see you, man. And you don't know, but what you did meant a lot to me. Um, let me see. I'll go from the, uh, to the other uh, end of the spectrum, um, mood-wise. This is a poem called Ode to Your Mother. Do you remember yourself six months after conception? Far from the egg, your heart chirping like a hungry chick. Those unwalked feet, fat crickets kicking around. Eyes blind as buttons, cell by cell, rod by cone, getting ready to call up the colors and lights. And your mother, often craving licorice with apple pie, outside catching a bus with you in her warm pond, a golden koi nosing the surface for bits of bread, you, the unnamed stranger, coming for the long stay, traveling all night, your face taking shape in the shadows. Or maybe, she sees herself, a bass drum with something booming inside her, 
a small theater off-Broadway with someone soon to be famous pacing the wings. So much promise. Were you restless to begin? All your vitals rehearsing their hard parts. Did you have any sense that she was out there? Your brain almost building itself. A secret mansion, a million doors to a million rooms, each with a candle, your little head holding the Milky Way rekindled in miniature. Consciousness, the great mischief, waking up to try again. One particular flicker in the cosmic sea, a starfish riding the big back of a blue whale, which swims like a planet, gliding the sun's slow waves with you, beginning to insist inside this woman you hardly know, though she is everything, steadying her new weight on Earth, time like gravity calling her in, the umbilical cord spooling you out like a kite, wind on the rise three months from day. Did you suppose an inkling of what would be out there? The invisible air filling us up, rabbits in hats, hints, houses, banana slugs, bacteria, and trees. Other people, the look on your face, already amazed, or whatever comes just before that. It's a poem called Allison Wolf. It's another Philly-related poem, <clears throat> um, though it's actually set in Jenkintown, <clears throat> right outside of Philly, where I ended up um, because of the public school strike in 1972, I think it was. Um, I was going to end up at Roxborough High School, but my mother said, there's going to be a strike, and it's going to be bad. You're going to the suburbs. So I ended up out there. And I was one of six black students in, in the whole school. And uh, I think that's all you need to know, except that I make reference to I Dream of Jeannie. And I know a lot of you are too young to know that was a TV show. So it was a TV show, and there was a genie who came out of the bottle. And she was so, so fine. She was. <laughs> I think that'll do it. And if you don't know who Emmett Till was. And Mattel was the young brother who, from Chicago who was basically um, uh, lynched because he theoretically whistled at a white woman in Mississippi. I think, I think that's all you really need to know. Allison Wolf. Like a river at night, her hair, the sky starless, street lights, glossing the full dark of it. Was she Jewish? I was 17, an Afro-American senior transferred to a suburban school that held just a few of us. And she had light brown eyes and tight tube tops and skin white enough to read by in a dim room. It was impossible not to be curious. Me and my boy, Terry, talked about pink babes sometimes. We watched I Dream of Jeannie and could see Barbara Eden in her skimpy finery, lounging on our very own lonely sofas. We wondered what white girls were really like, as if they'd been raised by the freckled light of the moon. I can't remember Allison's voice, 
but the loud tap of her strapless heels clacking down the halls is still clear. Autumn, 1972. Race was the elephant sitting on everybody. Even as a teenager, I took the weight as part of the weather, a sort of heavy humidity felt inside and in the streets. One day, once upon a time, she laughed with me in the cafeteria. Something about the tater tots, I guess, or the electric blue jello. Usually, it was just some of us displaced brothers talking noise, acting crazy, so she caught all of us way off guard. Then, after school, I smiled, and she waved, and the sun was out. That three o'clock after school sun rubbing the sidewalk with the shadows of trees. And while the wind pitched the last of September, we started talking, and the dry leaves shook and sizzled. In so many ways, I was still a child, though I wore my 17 years like a matador's cape. The monsters that murdered Emmett Till, were they everywhere? I didn't know. I didn't know enough to worry enough about the story white people kept trying to tell. And given the thing that America is, Maybe sometimes such stupidity works for the good. Occasionally, history offers a reprieve. Everything leading up to a particular moment suddenly declared a mistrial. So I'm a black boy suddenly walking the Jenkintown streets with a white girl. So ridiculously conspicuous, we must have been invisible. I remember her mother not being home and cold Coca-Cola in plastic cups and the delicious length of Allison's tongue. And we knew, without saying anything, we were kissing the color line goodbye. And on and on for an hour we kissed, hardly breathing, the light almost blinding whenever we unclosed our eyes as if we had discovered the dreaming door to a different country and were walking out, as if we could actually walk the glare we'd been born into, as if my hand on her knee, her hand on my hand, my hand in her hair, her mouth on my mouth, opened and opened and opened. I'll tell you what I'll do. Since we're on the subject of kissing, I'll read First Kiss. I'll read it for Suzanne Parker. And for everybody here who has lips, which is everybody. First Kiss. Her mouth fell into my mouth like a summer snow, like a fifth season, like a fresh Eden, like Eden when Eve made God whimper with the liquid tilt of her hips. Her kiss hurt like that. I mean, it was as if she'd mixed the sweat of an angel with the taste of a tangerine. I swear, my mouth had been a helmet forever greased with secrets, my mouth a dead-end street, a little bit lit by teeth. My heart, a clam, slammed shut at the bottom of a dark. But her mouth pulled up like a baby blue Cadillac, packed with canaries, driven by a toucan. <laughs> I swear, those lips said bright wings when we kissed, wild and precise, as if she were teaching a seahorse to speak. Her mouth so careful, chumming the first vowel from my throat, until my brain was a piano banged loud, hammered like that, 
It was like, I swear, her tongue was Saturn's seventh moon, hot like that, hot and cold and circling, circling, turning me into a glad planet. Sun on one side, night pouring her slow hand over the other, one fire flying the kite of another. Her kiss, I swear, if the great mother rushed open the moon like a gift and you were there to feel your shadow finally unhook from your wrist, that'd be it, but even sweeter, like a riot of peg-leg priests on pogo sticks. Up and up, this way and this, not falling, but on and on like that, badly behaved, but holy, I swear. That kiss, both lips utterly committed to the world, like a Peace Corps, like a free store, forever and always a new city, no locks, no walls, just doors, like that, I swear like that. And I'll close with this poem. Um, it's, it's called At 59, which I was at when I wrote this poem, but I am no longer at 59, I am 60. Um, so it's a, it's a poem that's written after Randall, Randall Jarrell's Next Day. Some of you will know that poem. I imagine you might, Michael. Um, but I, I tried to use the riff of his, the beginning of his piece um, to just propel me into this poem. It's a poem, again, of reflection. Um, I, make, I make mention of Muji. And Muji is, uh, I guess, a mystic. And he has, you know, he has ideas about things. And he wrote something about, um, well, I think it'll be, I'll be clear in the poem. I think you'll understand what his gesture was and why he's in here. All right. Oh, oh, also, um, for those of you who are not basketball people, I make reference to the block, which is that rectangle around the basket which is, you know, that's where you'll see like the big men play, like the big dudes, that's where they go in. And I make reference to being a posting up, which is when you play with your back to the basket and your defender is behind you, right? So I just want, if you don't know basketball, I just don't want to throw that at you if you don't know it. All right, at 59, roving from Nike to New Balance, Prince to Puma, I pick up a pair of size 13s, some shorts and blue sweats, still feeling the sneakered beast scuff his muzzle against my skull. Two tall, hard-shouldered young brothers fondle Air Jordans, talking a little shit. If I get you down on the block with these, motherfuckers will be calling you Betty. A drowning man Muji wrote, is not interested in air. And as the constellation that pardoned my life goes dark, I recognize this snag in my chest, this cut breath, this lonely late midlife knowing, the inescapable all around me, desperation all around my own stumbly efforts at love, my own trying to say, say something, while the duck-speaking dickheads salute their zombie platoons. Always big bad death posting me up, backing me down. The ball's trick bounce racking my heart. I know he's smooth with either hand, but still mean to snuff his shot. In my college days, when my parents were well and the bulk of worry sat elsewhere, I strolled around with my boys, and mostly we wanted the same things. To play sports, make big bucks, and have the fine babes find the come hither in our faces. What I miss is that damn sure hell yeah we carried like crisp cash. JC, his wit, that manic laugh, 
Eric's slick grin, and Doc, so thin, only his head cast shadow. That loud halo of hair. Don't touch the fro, he'd say. I miss my boys in the Ohio players funking us up against the earth's black hips. You a bad, bad missus with those skin tight britches running folks into ditches, yeah. We couldn't help ourselves. There's a girl, a young woman, I guess, in her mid-twenties, testing the exercise machines. A serious athlete wearing sneaks that mean speed, her righteous gluteus maximus rippling each lift and pull. What I wish, now that I'm older, is that she see through the three decades between us and work my back. But these days, I'm a sir, a gray beard to be addressed with deference, someone whose wisdom could maybe be vaguely revered. Oh, sex, songbook of our better angels, how I craved and savored your generous pages, chapter and verse and verse, kissing for hours, daylight lost to the liquid velvet of the tongue. The body, delicious synagogue, cello hungry to be bowed. I don't believe the longing ever ends. I can't believe I'll ever understand what I need to understand. But in college, I told Doc, probably by the time I'm 40, things won't get to me as much. As I look at my life, I'm afraid. And earlier today, in the mirror, I saw my mother's face, shocked at how old I am. My goodness, how old are you? And when I tell her, she's sure I'm lying. And to be honest, I just don't know if I'm the age I am. Each year, part of a conversation I almost had with someone I meant to call. You think maybe all you do adds up to a definable sum. The eulogy, a small fire that lets survivors warm their chilly hands. But really, nobody knows what turned inside you or why evolution has guaranteed that none of us stick around. Last night, a friend shrugged. Might as well be positive. And I want to believe in people because I'm a person. I think about kindness, how it flickers in a darkened place. And lynching, how some people loved it. And Malcolm X, his soul sweetened after Mecca, dying with buckshot scalding his chest. But whoever mentions Yuri Kochiyama holding his head in her lap. I believe in the last light of her hand on his cheek. Across the street beneath the sky blue sky, trees black barked and bare. I'm in a cafe now, surrounded by clattery laughs and scrambled chatter, a mad jazz that would scatter birds. What is it with this world? A while back, one of my boys died. I heard about it long after. The funeral somewhere in Georgia. So in my mind's eye, Dewey's still doing the bump. Party whistle gleaming in his mouth. Jungle boogie forever rocking the house. I used to think my lucky days made me different somehow. Some angel paying my way, like my mom said. But this poem could just as easily be Dewey almost remembering me at the same party, under the same groove, my fantastic history filed down to a few finger pops and some cool 
and the gang. It's hard to breathe without the delusion that magnified my life. I sat across from him in class. We both wrote poetry. Does everyone secretly believe they're indispensable? I sit inside this self, amazed by my face, which is brown and unremarkable. Thank you very much.